kom själv i kontakt med Alex och hans projekt i somras när jag var med på en sån här digital virtuell arkeologikonferens i Storbritannien. Jag var ute och gick in och sånt här vackert blommande gotländskt ängen när jag kopplade in mig på det här. Jag var lite tveksam så där i början att mm, Minecraft är inte där sånt här sånt här som barn leker med kan det vara någonting. Men jag blev positivt överraskad och jag tyckte att det här var värt även för andra att få ta del av. Oh, hello everyone. Um, thank you for introducing me Victor. I'd just like to thank him to begin with for making me aware of this opportunity and for giving me the chance to talk to you all today. Uh, it's a bit early in Britain, so forgive me if I look a bit tired. Um, I'll just get the screen share up. And there we are. Okay. Right. Mortonia, digital archaeology in storytelling. So uh, before I begin, these are the topics I'm going to be covering in this uh, webinar. In the interest of not leaving anyone behind or confusing anyone, or because I talk too fast or anything, uh, at the end of each topic, uh, you can ask questions. Uh, just put your mics on and I'll be happy to answer any questions if I've confused anyone, because I'm sure I will at some point. Um, let's just jump in. Uh, remember this image. I'll be coming back to this image, uh, but if you just keep it at the back of your mind, so that would be helpful. Uh, this image was taken about April, mid to late April 2019. Uh, you might be able to work out, it's a little watchtower that at the time was part of a uh, castle that was under construction. So this was two years ago, this image, so it's quite old. If you didn't know, uh, digital archaeology describes a number of things. It's quite an up and coming uh, little <coughs> subtopic, uh, sub school. Uh, Andrew Reinhardt is, I think, one of the leading voices. You may have heard of him. Other than him, I'm not sure there's too many people involved uh, pushing it towards the forefront of the wider archaeological spectrum. Uh, it very much relates to anything um, to do with technology, digital technology. It can relate to the physical excavations of uh, landfills made up of playstations. It can relate to excavations through layers of code inside a computer. But what I'm going to be talking about today is using a digital space to create something old. So the same way you'd go to Rome and you'd see the Colosseum and you'd go, oh, that's quite old. That's, Im that's impressive that it's so old. Uh, that same sort of logic, but in a digital space, that's what I'm going to be talking about. So uh, I'm very keen not to um, talk too fast or go over the top with my descriptions. Uh, Minecraft, it's a sandbox game made in 2009 by a Swedish person, actually. Uh, I think it's still made up of Swedish developers now. Uh, anyway, it's a sandbox game, so you can basically do whatever you like on it. There's no real purpose. You just create things and or destroy them. Up to you. Um, the terminology, some of this terminology, a Minecraft world is a digital sandbox that you create within the game. So it's just yours. And you can turn that into a server to allow uh, your friends to play. Mine has 11 concurrent players on at one time. Um, I'll just go back. That gentleman there, that's Sir Mortimer Wheeler, which is where the name Mortonia comes from. So one of the principles of this little humble little game, building. These are three examples of building a structure. As you can see from the one in the bottom left, that's just a box. You wouldn't really want to live there. But the one on the right, very nice. Imagine if that was real. Mm, tasty. Now, forgive me, this is the uh, one area where people might get a bit lost. Um, but what inspired this whole digital history project? Um, myself and the co-founder, Alex Beadle, we are both students of archaeology. So we've got a keen interest in old things. We love digging up old stuff, talking about old stuff. Um, and we wondered how to convert that whole idea into a digital space. And, you know, we're young adults. We love gaming. It's uh, just part of our generation, I guess. Uh, there is this one um, ongoing project, which I have no part in, but it, it was a direct inspiration, called 2B2T. 
it's a 10 year old Minecraft world. If I refer back to those definitions earlier, it's 10 years old. And as you can see in the uh, bottom right, it's had a vast timeline of events. Um, so in, in that regard, it's like sort of real history. It's this condensed timeline that's only occurring in this digital space. It's quite interesting in that regard. We saw that and we were like, hmm, what if we did that, but with an archaeological mindset? Here's uh, some more examples of, you get um, online historians who talk about this stuff. It's, uh, it's just quite interesting, you know, because all this history, all these people from around the world coming into a digital space and then leaving their mark. And then you have these amateur historians who make videos on it in the same way you would watch a documentary on the Viking colony in Greenland, something like that. Uh, before I carry on, is everyone following? Does anyone have any questions? No? Sure, perfect. So going back to what inspired this whole project to begin with, um, my dissertation is on the Carolingian annals covering the Viking invasion of uh, the Netherlands in the ninth century. The whole idea of a contemporary individual recording every single event in a uh, annal, the pictures in the bottom right is the annals of St. Fulda. That whole idea, but doing it in a digital space, so creating a, a digital log of history, that was what inspired this project. So here I'm just going to talk a little bit about how to date something within Minecraft, within a digital space. Um, on an excavation, which I'm sure many of you are, are experts on, uh, I'm just an amateur still, uh, but on an excavation, you know, you can dig up a bit of clay or pottery and you can work out roughly what time period that's from based on the materials used, how it was constructed, the sort of style. This structure was built in, once again, April 2019. The materials used to create it uh, all of which existed before April 2019, and it's using none of the materials that were added after April 2019. So by looking at a structure like this, you can work out that it cannot possibly be older than April 2019. That's sort of how to date within this digital world, which uh, creates a sense of things being old or new. Some more information. Uh, 685 days, that's more like 700 now, because I last edited this about 15 days ago. Um, those are the four main nationalities of people who've been on the uh, world. That's Belgium, by the way, not Germany. Um, two full years of digital history. So two full years of real world history isn't that much. But in a digital space, let's say that's the equivalent to 200 years or 2000 years. 152 individual players have come on this uh, project in those two years. Uh, only 11 max at a time, but still, each one of those has left their mark, and you can see that in the archaeological impact on the world. Here is an example of digital archaeology on a macro scale. Um, this right here is one castle that was built in April 2019. It was constructed in April 2019, and as time's gone on, you can see it's developed very much in the same way a real castle would have developed over years as it's constructed by, let's say, uh, King George, or another example, William the Conqueror, making his uh, Norman Long Towers. Uh, here, these two pictures, the uh, castle has gone through two separate rulers with different insignia being displayed on the, um, on the flags that hang off the sides, the banners. That's an example of, you know, if you were to just walk up to this castle at that point, you'd think, oh, you know, the leadership's changed. The same way you have sweeping invasions of England across the years, Vikings, Normans, Anglo-Saxons to begin with, Romans. Um, this is quite interesting. And I, I noticed the zoom is obscuring the text a bit, but I can, I can still read it for you. Um, the change in flags here was between a uh, marriage alliance between two players. Uh, they didn't actually get married in real life, but it's part of that whole storytelling aspect of the uh, world, the uh, gamification of these concepts, the whole idea of uh, any player can do whatever they like and it will be worked into the ever evolving timeline of this world. And these events happen, their impact stays forever. 
Here's some more example of uh, something being constructed. This took about three months to build. Here is a uh, battlefield, or rather the uh, preparations for a battlefield. Uh, you only need to have watched one medieval warfare movie, Kingdom of Heaven or something, or even Lord of the Rings, uh, to recognise what's going on here. You've got a curtain wall dividing one kingdom from another, and uh, the kingdom on the left in the bottom pick, uh, they have increased their garrison to the side in preparations for a battle. So yet again, it's taking these real world concepts of medieval armies mustering against one another, but putting it in a digital space. Oh, the Lord of the Rings mention comes back. Um, you may remember this if you've watched the film, but there's a part where one kingdom needs to call the aid of another. So they activate these beacon towers, which go all along the mountains. There, that's a real thing in medieval times, of course, uh, particularly in the Far East. Um, this is another example of those same concepts being put into Minecraft. A um, bit different here because you can't have a eternally burning pyre of logs. So you have a lamp. Here are just some random examples of archaeology being used, um, archaeological influences being used on this uh, server. That one in the uh, bottom middle is based on an Assyrian siege tank, which was featured in a mural from, it's not my area of expertise, but I think from 6000 BC, thereabouts. Uh, top right, you've got um, so that was previously a World War One trench recreation, but very much in the same way the Somme, parts of the Somme were blown up. There was a mass bomb underneath all of that ground that was then detonated and uh, spread all of that debris everywhere. We've also got a river galleon on the bottom left and then a classic medieval castle on the bottom right. But... At the end of the day, this is just a simplistic game. It's a game made up of blocks. Um, you build anything, but it's made up of blocks. So you can't make a true circle. You can't, you can't do everything. You can't make honeyed pork. You can't um, do backflips. You can't do everything you want. But these limitations make the idea of, as I said, porting these uh, aspects of history into a digital space quite, quite interesting because you have to work with these limitations. As you can see there in those diagrams, Making something diagonal is a pain because it just looks quite pixely from the side. And circles, you've got to have charts to make sure it's even. There's an example of a sphere. And uh, here's a hot air balloon that uh, someone tried to make. Obviously, uh, a real one wouldn't look quite as uh, blocky. Uh, on the uh, right there, you can see a recreation of the Pharos of Alexandria which, like the real thing, became a ruin. So yet again, this is another example of these um, real legendary monuments from history. Someone coming on the world and thinking, oh, that's cool, I'm going to build that. And then history repeats. Uh, some further limitations of using this, uh, this game as a storytelling device is lag. Now, uh, lag is an issue uh, the more and more people who connect to this world, the more lag there is. It takes the form of it slows down everything. So uh, your connection doesn't work when you're trying to join. When you are on there, it's really dodgy, intermittent connection, keeps kicking you off, that sort of thing. Um, there's some terminology here. Again, I don't want to speed up and leave anyone in the dust. Uh, when you have too many uh, entities in a world at the same time, an entity is a specific type of item that you can make in the game. If you have too many of them, it can cause lag. Uh, you also get these things called chunk errors, which I'll be going back to later. These are, if I go back to those original picks, you see the terrain there looks quite natural, albeit blocky. Imagine if that terrain suddenly went uh, snowy or turned into a desert for no reason. That's an example of a chunk error, which is caused by lag. So again, these are the uh, limitations of the uh, software. Because it's now two years old, the file size of this project has quadrupled. It's now uh, so large that I can't just download it and preserve it. Um, so it has to be online at all times, which means you can't really eternally preserve anything because if someone wanted to destroy 
say that castle at the start, that'd be it, it'd be gone. But much like in real life, you have to live with the consequences. You can create a book in the game, as you can see in the bottom, that can be used to uh, write something. I use that to create the in-game annals uh, inspired by the Carolingian annals of real life. You can create poems, you can create anything, you can write your own story, and that exists in-game in a book. Okay, now I'm going to be talking about the uh, timeline of this two-year period. Uh, before I get into it, does anyone have any questions or anything they want cleared up before I get into the nitty-gritty? We have one question in the chat here. Uh, yep. What about the possibility of sound? Sound effects, talk, music, is creative use a part of it? Uh, sound as in talking to your friends or creating your own music, that sort of thing? I, I suppose it's, uh, it doesn't really say, but sound effects, talk, or music, and, and if, it's, yeah, if it's creative use, um, it's part of the game. I think well, it might include soundscapes like sound of waves and winds and animals and such things. Oh, I see, I see. Uh, there are a number of sound files in the game, so every animal will have a number of sound effects. Chickens, uh, cluck, pigs oink, etc. Um, water has a sound effect, so I, there's not quite crashing waves, but water will have a distinct sound effect if you're near it. You can also create your own music in the game. Uh, which is quite complex to do, even I can't do it, but you can do it. So there's a creative aspect there. And just for clarification, you can like talk to all your mates on it. There's an in-game chat feature, or you can um, open up second software such as Zoom and just talk to them through that. I hope that answers your question, unless there's anything else. As I can see in the chat, I think uh, many participants are not very familiar with uh, Minecraft per se, like what the game is about, how you start. Uh, these buildings you can see here, it's really impressive, even intimidating. So uh, what do you, how do you start, Alex? How did you get the idea to start this Mortonia? And uh, what were your first buildings and thoughts about it? The first buildings I ever did on this game well, I've been playing for a decade because it's uh, quite an old game. Um, it's intuitive, so don't feel intimidated. You can do whatever you like on it. You can just come on and build a little block if you want, a little square house like that one we saw at the start. Um, but the stuff on Mortonia, I guess it's a little more advanced than the uh, beginner stuff, but you can still join uh, and there's no problem there. As I said, it's an intuitive game, so you, you should be able to get into it from having very minimal experience of gaming overall. Uh, I think Minecraft is the most popular game in the world because of that, because of how accessible it is. Oh, and there's another que question. In which ways can a popular culture affect positive, negative, neutral, the perception of history? For example, romantic scenes of specific times in history such in Camelot or stereotypes and battles, architecture constructed by the film industry? Yeah, that's a brilliant question. I'll be, I'll be coming to both archaeological and historical influences later. Uh, if, if you want me to cover that now, I can, but that will be covered later. And the uh, blending of fantasy films and real history and uh, the romanticism of all of that. So I'll, I'll be getting to that later, if that's all right. Oh, there is one here watching together with his son. Really fascinating. Yeah, it's popular with the younger audiences, this game. Small practical uh, question here as well. Uh, can anyone join Mortonio is it, or is it password protected? No, anyone can join. Um, Victor, you have my contact details. So at the end of this, if you could give them out, I have no problem with that. And if you email me, then I can uh, let you join. All you need to do is purchase the game, which I think is about 20 quid. Uh, 20 pounds sorry yeah british slang <laughs> yeah it's about 20 pounds uh but and it runs on um even low-end laptops mine's not that good but mine runs uh very well it can run on phones as well i think you can have it up on your phone um on your xbox or playstation it runs on everything so yeah very easy to get in excellent thank you that's all the questions for now sure okay the timeline um, much in the same way real life is divided into BC and AD and then all the minutiae 
I know for Britain specifically, uh, we've got Dark Age, Viking Age. Viking Age is my favourite. Um, Norman period, uh, so on and so on. Medieval Tudors, Elizabethan. Um, we took that sort of principle and much like they did with the earlier 2B2T project example, uh, we put that into Mortonia as well. So it's a very handy way of dating things. So you can say, oh, that thing's old. It's from the age of beginnings. Oh, it's very old. Uh, I can speed through this or I can take it slow. Uh, but this is just a list of events, notable events that I thought to mention in this webinar. Um, on, yeah, the world wasn't even named as Mortonia. This project didn't even have a name until well over a month after creation. Um, my good mate and co-founder Alex Beadle came up with the name, uh, once again based on our favourite archaeologist, Sir Mortimer Wheeler. We just put Onia on the end of his name. Oh, this is a good example. So this right here is a little beach hut built by one of our Dutch friends who came on. Um, that's my name there. I visited that on the 8th of November 2019 and I thought I'll leave a sign because then if future people visit, that's a record of me being there. So that's a little tiny example of digital history. The same way a brilliant example would be in Istanbul or Constantinople. Uh, in the Hagia Sophia, on one of the top uh, layers above the Grand Entrance Hall, there is a uh, Viking graffiti carved in. This guy, I think, I think his name is Haftan, although they're, they're not sure, but he says Haftan was here. So that's the sort of same principle. Obviously, I'm not as impressive as a as a Varangian warrior, but people people could show up there and they'd go, "Oh, Alex was here." Some more examples of some events. Uh, as you can see, a lot happens. Uh, some of these terminology I can dive into later if anyone has any questions, but uh, right at the top there, FECM, I think that stands for the first empirically choked cartographical analysis of Mortonia. Um, I don't know my history about world, real world maps, but the uh, sense of how much better people can understand planet Earth when they've got a map of it that same principle was once again ported into this digital world before FECM, so before the 16th of December 2019, we did not have a map of this world. We um, travelled from one corner to the other via roads, but then uh, one individual had the idea, uh, Jacob, Jacob Bramley, another, another colleague, he had the idea of um, creating a map so people would know where they were at all times. That's an example of how this world evolves over time. Sort of like uh, the Enlightenment period of real world. Here's an example of a battle, which I'll be talking about later. Oh, I've moved the zoom bar. We can stay there for now. Um, here's an example of a battle. This was a naval battle between uh, two sides, the people on the right and the people on the left, and then that big ship in the middle that's attached to the people on the right. Um, wars happen on this project the same way they do in real life, sadly. Um, it's another example of uh, player agency and storytelling and how it's evolved into the timeline. So if, for instance, one player decides, oh, you've built a very nice um, spot of land there. Could I have it? And they say, no, well, I I'll invade. There you are, there's a war. Um, simple, but that sort of stuff happens in real life. So um, on the 17th of July, 2020, where it says the digital history video was released. That was the previous work I did with the uh, Council for British Archaeology. I released a three part video series introducing uh, Mortonia to wider academia. And since then, um, we've had quite a bit of interest, obviously most notably being Victor. So thank you once again for contacting me, for giving me this opportunity. But since then, there's been a big uptick in uh, people wanting to join. And as I said, you just need to email me and I'll let you on. Uh, this is more recent. The whole idea of a digital dark age. So prior to the 4th of August 2020, as I said at the start, uh, you had these books in game that recorded every single event. So say, for instance, on the 5th of May 2019, I decided to make a farm. It would then be written if you scroll back far enough in this book on the 5th of May. Alex decided to make a farm. And then you can go out and find that farm and you can think, ah, oh, this is two years old. Once again, 
you know, inspired by real timelines, et cetera, et cetera. The picture on the right is uh, quite an interesting idea of something old being repurposed in the same sense um, in the Dark Ages, uh, specifically in Britain, because I'm not too familiar with um, French Roman ruins and so on. Uh, in Britain, when the uh, Romans left in AD 411, I think, you had um, Celts and um, these Britannic tribes. They all took up residence in these old Roman ruins and repurposed them for their own good. This was, the picture on the right, was a railway. As you can see, as it extends off screen, it was a big railway, which has been torn down after it was abandoned and repurposed as a curtain wall by this new kingdom that's taken up residence in that same spot. So that's not simply just a wall. I suppose if you didn't know it was a former railway, you'd just think, oh, it's a nice looking wall. But with that knowledge, again, there's more of that, those layers of digital history. It's no longer just a wall. It's something that was built beforehand and then repurposed. Present day, um, Mortonia is in dire straits currently, wartime or post-war time. Uh, much in the same way, you know, present day, especially now, especially 2020, we go through a, a peaks and dips of uh, when, when times are good and when times are bad. Hopefully uh, 2021 is a good year. Right, uh, back onto the good stuff. Archaeological and historical influences. Uh, so I'll quickly answer that question earlier about uh, romanticising specific periods of history. I will agree there is definitely an element of that uh, within um, Minecraft. But as it's a game and it has some fantasy elements, for example, there's a dragon in it, which you can ignore if you don't want to do that. There's dragons and zombies. Um, whenever you port, say, a Colosseum into this digital space, it's, it's never going to be a one-to-one -one copy. There's always going to be elements of, um, excuse me, elements of fantasy involved. And this is a this is a brilliant example. The one on the right. That is a uh, archway gate inspired by uh, the Roman style of architecture. Obviously nothing Roman that's still standing today looks that white and pristine. And the likelihood is, especially marble statues, when they were created in ancient Greece and ancient Rome, they were quite colored. They were painted and a lot of that paint has eroded since then. But you don't often see that in um, historical media. Uh, HBO's Rome, I don't think, features that many uh, coloured statues, to name one example. And all the ancient Greek uh, games and shows and films that are out there, they all just have marble statues with no colour on them whatsoever. So that marble gate right there, uh, someone liked how Rome is portrayed in films and TV and thought, no, I don't really need to add any colour. I like it how it is. So that right there is an example of, um, you know, how periods are portrayed in the media and that uh, blending over into Minecraft. On the left, we have a Iron Age Cranach. I think it's inspired by a Scottish or Pictish um, water fort. Uh, you can see right there the uh, limitations of Minecraft once again with everything being a block. Obviously a thatched roof in the Dark Ages in real life would not be so thick and sturdy. It'd be quite flimsy and straight. So once again, it's not one-to-one. -one. You can't recreate these things one-to-one. -one. This is recent, actually. This is uh, something I made. Um, Alexander the Great famously used a uh, city taker or a helopolis, as it's called, to uh, try and besiege the city of Rhodes. I think it was one of his last uh, besieges. Anyway, it didn't go very well. That's how they built the Colossus of Rhodes. But I really like the design. And for the uh, recent war that I just mentioned, the War of Independence, I built, I re recreated that to try and get over a wall that is as you can see, much smaller than it. <laughs> so it was a bit of a uh, over-exaggeration. But that most of these designs, as you've seen throughout the video, are just people who uh, see something cool from history and they go, hey, I want to build that. Uh, sometimes it's romanticised. Um, obviously, that's not a direct copy. Other times it's, hey, I quite like uh, Alexander the Great's design. However, it could be better. So I'm going to add some stuff. But it is all rooted in, in history. Most of the people who play on the server are um, either history aficionados or students of archaeology or history. Here are some more examples. Uh, that in the middle is a Viking long haul. Very cosy. Um, I built that after doing a uh, Viking module on Viking Age Scandinavia 
learning about um, all sorts of stuff. It was interesting, Trelleborg forts, uh, classic long halls, the uh, Mead halls of 5th century Sweden, I think. Thimble winter, all that. So I took that inspiration and I thought, I want to put that in uh, Morsonia. So I built a longhouse. Um, everything you see in the video has evolved like that. Um, top right, that's a great example of the fantasy element. Uh, a ship that big, uh, obviously, is quite uh, unfeasible in a medieval scenario. Same as that uh, figurehead, the dragon's head. Here are some more examples. Uh, top left, you might not be able to see it clearly because I've accidentally obscured it by a fortress, but that is a uh, Iron Age salt turn. Uh, so a little structure next to a salt water ocean that takes in salt water and converts it to fresh water. You can't actually do that in game. So this is just a merely uh, aesthetic build, but the same sense of learning something in, in lesson and then recreating it in a digital space. It was a really good way of uh, learning how these structures worked in Iron Age Britain. That's what that design's uh, built off. So although university, well, my university, it doesn't directly say, oh yes, use Minecraft to uh, get your head around these archeological concepts. It is something you can do. Uh, bottom right, that's uh, industrial steampunk-esque China. So once again, that's an example of mixing uh, steampunk fantasy with real history, which is uh, the person who built this is a big uh, fan of uh, Far Eastern history. That hot air balloon once again. Uh, on the left, there's some boats there. Uh, boat designs, that one is extremely widespread across Mortonia, which covers a square area of about 14,000 miles, I think, or more, 16,000 maybe. Uh, but that particular boat design, if you saw that, you'd know instantly who built that. That's Jacob's boat design, he's put them everywhere. Uh, onto historical influences, which at least for me is a bit different to an archeological influence. Um, building something that resembles uh, a Roman temple um, is more archeological to me because it's just a structure, but acting like the Roman empire, that to me is a historical influence. Um, that might be not everyone's definition, but that's how I separate them, at least in regards to this project. Uh, so what that means uh, within Mortonia, if you want to build a uh, Roman empire, you've got to fit yourself into the mindset of a Roman emperor. It could be benevolent or quite evil, like some of them were. Um, or even more recently, the British Empire or, or America's foreign policies. You know, if you want to act like one of them, you just invade all your neighbours, invade everyone. Um, there's a Viking example later, which is uh, probably the best uh, pictorial example. Um, there are the uh, in-game annals that I mentioned earlier. As you can see, you can pick these books up while you're in Mortonia, open them and read them, and you get a pretty condensed timeline of what people have done over the years. I won't read all of that out. Uh, but on the left, there's just some more examples of uh, how history can influence player agency, which once again influences storytelling. Uh, there's someone on the uh, server who really likes um, both the British Empire and Estonia. So he's created his own in-game language, mixing Estonian uh, dialect, which I'm not at all familiar with, so I won't try and butcher it, uh, Estonian dialect and British. It's this strange hybrid lingo, but it's uh, a brilliant example of that creativity. So there's nowhere in Minecraft that says, yes, you can use this to create your own language, but he's done it anyway because of uh, how Mortonia exists as a project. It just sort of lends itself to these things. Um, players have made their own religions. Uh, that cathedral way back at the start, that was one religion, a dragon themed religion. Uh, and when two religions meet on a map, you get hybrid faiths, religious hybridity. A brilliant example in real life would be the Gosforth Cross in um, Anglo-Scandinavian England in the Danelaw, an example of the Old Norse Pantheon and Ragnarok mixing with Christianity. That same sort of stuff happens here. Uh, I'll move on to the next topic now. So does anyone have any questions before I carry on? There's quite a few. Um, Brilliant. We have uh, one here. Um, when you 
talked about the possibility possibility to destruct things. Yeah. Is it possible that someone would join the game with their destructive intentions and ru ruin all the buildings? How can you gain destructive power and is it somehow related to the amount of constructions you have done? Good question. Uh, so yeah, you are free to uh, blow things up. I guess you could also say you are free to do that in real life, but you face horrible consequences if you do. That's the exact same logic here. So if someone comes on and just wants to destroy things and not contribute, then they'll just get removed uh, because we don't tolerate just rampant destruction. There's a difference uh, when, as I mentioned earlier, when the server is in wartime, when we all decide mutually, yes, let's do a war because we disagree on some things, so we want to fight it out. Um, then d destruction happens, but it's limited. So um, on the bottom right there, that was a battlefield. We designated that beforehand as an area where things can get destroyed. So everything built in there wasn't of high value importance. Whereas all the other builds that you've seen today, if someone destroyed them, that would just not be tolerated because they're not in areas of war and they took quite a lot of time to, to create. Mm -hmm. So there are rules, but it's very much the people who come on are already respectful of not doing that. Yep. Uh, and I don't think I'd let anyone who wanted to do that. Uh, we have one more technical and uh, quick question. Is Mortonio in Java or Bedrock? Oh yeah, I should have specified that at the start, sorry. It's uh, Bedrock. Uh, we've experimented with porting it to Java. However, the problem there is a lot of the people who play on, on uh, Mortonia don't have the best PCs and uh, Java Minecraft doesn't run as, as uh, well as Bedrock. Also, there's that whole accessibility angle of anyone being able to join from their Xbox, from their phone, from their Nintendo. Uh, Java just doesn't have that. So while we may uh, port, it, port it to Java in the future, right now, we haven't. Yep. Uh, also, last question here is, uh, do you log historical information in connection to your historical builds? Um, I assume that's the historical eras or, or that you were talking about the um, things like a Roman Empire, uh, etc. Oh, I see. So, uh, well, that, that's a very good question, actually. Uh, looping it back around to what inspired the whole project to begin with, those Carolingian annals, because uh, I studied them for my dissertation. There's three main Carolingian annals. Uh, the Annals of San Burton, the Annals of Fulda, and the Annals of Xanten. I think there's another one, but the main three are those three. Each one covers a specific uh, era of Francia in the ninth century, and they all describe the same events. However, they all have their own biases. Some will lie. Um, one famous instance will be there was a Viking beneficiary of Frisia called Rorik of Dorstad. Uh, he helped out the Carolingian Empire quite a lot. However, one of the Annals... Um, didn't like him so they never mentioned that he helped them out and you'd only get that information from another animal so in that regard within Mortonia itself you'll have some history books which describe every event as it happened with no bias and then you'll have someone else's history book which will only describe their point of view so that whole motto history is told by the victor mm -hmm. sort of how uh, Britain romanticizes the Victorian periods or um, I can't think of another example. That's the best one. Yeah. Or America romanticizes um, the 1960s, that sort of thing. Yeah. I hope that answers um, the question. So, so, sort of uh, a spin off to that, or maybe you already answered that by that, is uh, how do you keep track of everything that happens, or is that necessary? How do we keep track of everything? Um, so I'll get back to this at the end, but for now, we put everything that's ever happened inside a book in game. Uh, there's 50 pages per book. So if you think every day is a book, some days, um, no, sorry, every day is a page. Some days have multiple pages. There's about 30 uh, history books right now. Mm -hmm. They are all stored in a museum, which I'll mention later. Um, so players are, fr are free to go in there and read them the same way you would a public library. But there's also... Uh, out of game, there's also Microsoft Word documents, which have it all copied and pasted, so they, they're safe. Great. Thank you. That's all the questions for now. Sure. Thank you for asking the questions. It's, it's good for me to just elaborate on these things.
as I was saying, uh, play agency. Um, I actually just answered that in a question, yeah. Um, there are no rules, but, you know, if you want to go and blow something up, you'll face the consequences immediately. No one will be happy with you and you won't have a good time. So you might as well just not do that. Uh, but on the instances of where smaller crimes have happened, so uh, one building has been blown up rather than several, uh, we've had instances of full legal trials, which is another example of that player agency. Um, I'll get onto that when, when we watch the video because there's a little uh, trial video. Um, further answering that question that was just asked on the digital timeline, uh, it's all stored in books. And while there are some biases in, in the uh, history logs, just as there are in real life, we try to work every single action that's ever happened into these, um, into these books, even if they're accidental. So uh, one, one, one good example would be, we were all preparing for a battle. And then uh, one of the leaders of uh, one of the armies fell down a hole and died. So that's uh, quite embarrassing. We could have not written that in the book. We could have just said, yeah, they both stormed into battle and there was a valiant clash. But instead we wrote the truth. So even little accidents like that, um, I keep referring back to the Carolingian annals, but uh, I think it was Louis the German. It might have been Louis the German. I know it wasn't Louis the Pious, but uh, Louis the German, uh, he died quite embarrassingly by chasing some girl through a French village and he ran into a wall and then hurt his kidneys, I think, and then just died later. So that's not a very noble end for a king, but that's still written in the history logs the same way falling down a pit on the way to a battle is written down. Oh, here's, here's a really good example of uh, putting yourself into a historical mindset. So this is something I did. Uh, I made a little Viking settlement because I love Vikings. I just love them. Uh, and I thought, you know, I'm going to pretend to be a bit of a Viking on this, on this digital world. So I made this long ship, which you can see in the bottom there. I went on a few raids with it. Um, and then I died, my character died uh, on a raid, and uh, this longship had uh, been with me for a few weeks, so I thought, you know, I'm going to bury my former self inside the longship. A uh, classic example would be the Osseberg ship in Norway, which I'd learnt about a couple of weeks before doing this, so again, you know, it's, we're all archaeology students, we see something cool in lesson and we're like, you know, I want to I put that and explore that in this digital space. So I moved the longship from the water up onto this hill and then I interred it in a, in a hill mound with the uh, front half of it sticking out just as the Osseberg ship was, which allowed other players to come into that hill mound and then deposit grave goods. So this is probably my favourite example in the entire slideshow of digital archaeology because in a year from now, someone could come up to this mound and they'd see, um, well, the front half would be covered up just like the Osseberg was in real life, but they'd see this mound. And then if they dug into it, they'd see a chest full of grave goods deposited by other players. And they'd wonder, you know, who put this there? What was the story behind that? That is the ethos of this project, really. Uh, you might recognize this. This is a, probably an even more famous game than Minecraft, World of Warcraft. I haven't played it myself, but there's a concept in World of Warcraft that we put into Mortonia, which is dungeon crawling. You're exploring, you know, this wild, untamed historical landscape and you find an ancient tomb and you want some treasure. So you go into the tomb with your mates and uh, fight all the beasties within. So this is less about archaeology, this segment, and more about fantasy. The dungeon master role. Uh, I've filled this role a couple of times and uh, a couple of my mates have. Uh, what that involves is making an adventure for other players to find and then explore. You make, for example, a pyramid in a desert and then a, a collection of catacombs and tunnels and traps and then treasure at the end. And then once that's made, you go, all right, everyone, time for an adventure. So you're making history there. You're making a story for your, for your mates to go through and experience. So these are all memories, you know, making memories in a digital space. These are some examples of these dungeons. A lot of them involve uh, quite complex coding behind the scenes. So they're quite tricky to pull off 
um, especially now that the size of the world, the world file, is uh, too big to download. So we can't actually make these anymore. But there was a period where there was a lot of them. And I guess, uh, much like the earlier individual mentioned uh, romanticizing periods of history, the period of history where there were a lot of dungeons and everyone was having adventures every month, that's uh, quite fondly remembered now by uh, myself and the other players. We think back and we go, ah, if only we could do that again. That was really fun. But there were actually quite a lot of problems with that period because uh, a lot of it was quite uh, glitchy. There was lag, which I mentioned earlier, you know, people were losing uh, connectivity. But much in the same way, the British Empire only remembers the nice parts of the Victorian period. Uh, so do we. Uh, this is uh, referencing some out of game stuff. Uh, this is a poster I made to advertise an event that happened within Mortonia. Uh, this coincided with an update to the game. Uh, updates we don't control. This is what the uh, Swedish developers make. Um, and we changed the rules for this update. We just had a fun little event. But this is all to keep players interested, to change things every now and then. Uh, so people, you know, always have something to look forward to. Uh, this is another great example. So this map um was created i think late 2019 but it was before a lot of these structures which are painted over in red on microsoft paint it was created before these structures were built so someone took a screenshot of the game put it in microsoft paint and then planned out their whole kingdom their whole layout to then um, achieve at a later date they now have actually built all of this but that's a good example of using external software to uh role play as a city planner, I guess. So keeping on with the map example, this is something I've done. Uh, on the right, the right hand side, that is a uh, Viking Age map, uh, 15th century actually, sorry, my bad, 15th century map uh, of Norse travelers to Vinland, to America, before there was an actual map, uh, you know, of that whole region. Obviously the world does not look like that on the right, but these were, not Vikings, but Viking descendants using their knowledge of the uh, land masses and the islands to build up a map that, while not accurate, at least represents the distance between uh, Hispaniol on the right, um, I guess that's France, yeah, and uh, America. On the left, uh, we have a Viking map. Once again, I did this based on the map on the right. This is a Viking map of um, Mortonia itself. The actual land masses do not look like that at all. They're not circular and really straight. But this is, if you were to imagine the map from the perspective of someone who didn't have access to anything uh, cartographical. Vikings famously traveled the world using uh, just the moon and the stars. I think there's some debate whether they use sunstones and sundials, but yeah, they didn't have maps as we know them or compasses. So the whole idea of making a map just based on that limited knowledge, inspired that piece on the left, which was made using external software. But again, it's enriching that role-playing idea. This is a, another great example. All of these are great examples. I keep saying they're great examples. Um, this is another handy way of dating something within the game. Uh, the Canon design on the right, called the Scaros design, because it resembles a Dalek from Doctor Who, uh, which is what the uh, person thought of. That design was created uh, May 2020, and then it cropped up all over the place afterwards. So if you see that design, you will know that it was not made before May 2020, and you'll know that it was inspired by the original design. I can't think of a real world example off the top of my head, but you know, if you saw that design out in the world, you'd think, ah, oh, you know, it's it's definitely older than May. Um, more, yeah, this is um going back to that uh, question about what's to stop people from destroying things. Uh, this was a prank someone played. They rebuilt that castle on the left, uh, perfectly rebuilt it, but it was hollow and nowhere near the original location. And then they blew it up and sent a photo to the creator of the castle on the left saying, oh, look at my handiwork. So that was a prank, you know, no one was harmed. But um, that uh, he was so annoyed, he started a war because of that. So again, that's player agency being worked into the timeline. 
Um, good example. This right here on the bottom right, this was a fortress made by an American uh, person who joined about two years ago or less. I think it was around December 2019. Anyway, he made this castle and then uh, got too busy with work. So he left and said he wasn't going to come on. So we aged his castle to a ruin to reflect that it was abandoned and to reflect the passage of time um, as he's been gone. And then later, because that plot of land was no longer in use, I uh, gifted it to Jacob, who then repurposed it into his own castle. Excuse me. Looping back round to how uh, Dark Age Britons repurposed Roman ruins. This is another ruin, uh, as you can see by the scaffolding and the uh, wooden supports that was in the process of being rebuilt. Oh. Right, on to the Dark Ages. And then there's a little video and then we can ask some more questions. Um, as I keep saying throughout this webinar, the whole idea of recording every single event in game onto these little books means that there's uh, a lot of accountability. Someone can't do something and then it not be recorded. So if you, if you uh, blow something up, your name will be written in the book. And then there's a record that you've always uh, done that crime. But ever since the 4th of August, 2020, we've had a little mini experiment of what happens if you no longer record history, very similar to the uh, real uh, Western dark ages of real world. So the, the complete lack of recorded history just means people have been doing whatever they want and getting away with it. Uh, there was a mini terrorist attack on the uh, 31st of January, which there's a video footage of. Now this video is made by the person who uh, performed the terrorist attack. So he's, he's lying in the video about everyone else falsifying evidence. But anyway, this is a video of a legal trial that went on on the server. I think uh, Bjorn has the capacity to play the video. Yep, I do. Um, I'm just going to have to uh, stop the presentation yep. for a second there. And then we're going to. So could you perhaps uh, stop the screen share? Sure. And I'll... There we are. Yeah. I can answer questions after this uh, video. So there's a question here about the collaboration between participants. Yep. How often does it happen that participants builders work on the same building? Uh, quite often. Um, I mean, the project overall was started by myself and my good friend. So it started on collaboration. We've since moved on to doing separate things, but uh, very often, especially recently, uh, you know, we just team up with our buddies and build the same thing. It's in in many ways more fun to play with friends than just everyone doing their own thing. But uh, always there is that sense of community. So while you may have your own castle, there's always spaces in the world where everyone will appear at certain times or chill out and you can go and trade with them or just, you know, have a race or something fun, have a Coliseum fight. So there's always that community sense. Excellent. Now we're rolling, rolling the video. I can explain what went on in that video on the next few slides if uh, people have questions.
Shall I go back to screen sharing? Yep, just go. Okay. Uh, so what happened in that video, we were having a legal trial um, over the person who actually made that video, so Jacob. Uh, what had been going on uh, was his actions has, had caused a lot of connectivity issues, so people were getting disconnected. Uh, the game was really slow because of things he'd done. Maybe not on purpose, but he, he was the cause. So we had this trial as a little, um, as a little like fun joke to see if he was truly guilty. Obviously, he didn't think he was. Yeah. Um, and what had happened before the trial? He'd rigged the courtroom with explosives, um, set to a timer. So if he was found guilty, he could escape and then blow everyone up. And that's the aftermath. So uh, no one was punished for this explosion because it was just a small one and it was uh, quite funny. So the, there was no malicious intent with blowing up this courtroom. It was just a, you know, a little prank. So before I move on to the uh, final third, does anyone have any questions? There's none in the chat at this point. Sure, I can I can blitz through this next bit. So moving back to the limitations of using Minecraft as a storytelling device, especially in regards to how old things are. Um, as I said before, Mortonia is a massive file at this point. It started off around 20 megabytes. It's now 20 gigabytes, which may not seem a lot, but when it's when you're mapping the whereabouts of 150 individual people from around the world who all have their own projects. They're all built multiple things. They all have uh, various items in their inventory, which is how you carry things around in game, pardon me. Uh, that's led to a lot of lag, which that trial was just about. Um, I mentioned chunk areas, chunk areas earlier. This is an example of one. As you can see, that terrain does not look natural at all. That was a mountain that's just been cut through by uh, a landmass from miles away. I guess it's a bit like continental drift if it happened randomly without warning and destroyed cities. Uh, another issue with using Minecraft as a storytelling device is when updates drop, they have the chance to um, you know, break quite a lot of features, which you then have to adapt to. The new update, which is coming out this summer, is extending the depth and height of the world by um, 64 meters each way. Um, as we, we, we can't go below that depth currently, you're gonna have these massive holes beneath um, the current uh, bottom of the world where all this new stuff is generated, which is gonna cause quite a lot of lag. Um, I did keep repeating that it's uh, too much to download. That's not strictly true. I can download the world file. However, it takes me about a full day on my Wi-Fi uh, of, of spending looking at that loading screen right there, which is a screenshot I took <laughs> of just waiting for the uh, initializing download to go to a progress bar and then on and on and on. But it, you know, it's worth it to preserve that digital history, which I'll get back to at the end because there's sad news, I'm afraid. Uh, onto the topic of a digital museum. Uh, which I've mentioned several times. This is a place that I built within the um, within the Mortonia itself, where timeless artifacts are stored, and every single book that anyone's ever written, uh, interesting artifacts. Um, just think about like the Natural History Museum or um, the Vatican. They're the museums I've been to. I haven't been to that many. Um, but the this isn't something I've built. The uncensored library which you may be familiar with, it gained worldwide news earlier last year. This is a project in Minecraft that I think someone made in China or Russia. And it's a building inside the game that contains a book of every single book ever written on earth, um, which means it's um, it can get away with, it can get under the censorship firewalls of uh, some of those um, you know, Far Eastern countries. So that's an example of a, of a digital place, you know, having real information in books. Uh, this is something I went over in my previous videos with the Centre for British Archaeology, but 
digital sentimentality. Uh, it's the whole idea of, I'm, I'm sure all of you will have something in your home that's quite old or that's been with you for a while. I know Bjorn, you have some nice looking computers behind you that look a bit old. I'm, I'm sure you've got nice memories of them or you know you have sentimental attachment to them because of, of their age or you know memories that you've had. Uh, applying that same logic in game, uh, a great example would be that pickaxe on the left. That's hanging in the museum. This um, pickaxe uh, was the first to um, obtain a monumental new uh, material, new mineral in the game. So that gave it value, that gave it sentimentality. And now that it's in the museum, um, people will walk past it and they'll go, oh my God, that's the pickaxe that was used to do X. That's really cool. The same way how this uh, armor set on the right was the first one in the game to be made from that material, which gives it intrinsic value. So if you were to play this game normally, these things wouldn't necessarily have value, but this is very much a case of the player uh, putting that value on these digital items the same way I could put value on this mug of tea right here because I like the mug. Yeah, as I said, uh, this museum contains relics as old as the first day that Mortonia was created. I created a wooden pickaxe on the first day. So that is a digital item that's 700 days old, um, which makes it very old by Minecraft standards. So that's in the museum. People can go and look at it. And while it is um, objectively an extremely cheap item to create because it's so old, people will go, oh, that's so old. Uh, the museum's also used for education. Um, this player here who made this exhibit, he's the one who made his own language, combining Estonian and uh, some miscellaneous Baltic languages and then English. He has dozens of flags for all his different um, sub-regions within his kingdom. There's so many flags, I've lost count, but uh, he made this exhibit to educate people. So if they come on Mortonia and they see these flags, they'll know if they look at the museum, what they mean. Um, this is another movie reference I'm gonna bring in, uh, but you know, in disaster films, uh, Roland Emmerich's 2012, or more recently Greenland starring Gerard Butler, there'll always be a scene where they uh, take the Mona Lisa down from its exhibit in the Louvre and they put it in like a vault. Uh, Mortonia, due to these chunk errors that keep happening, these massive continental shifts that are destroying people's cities, uh, there's nothing we can do about it, I'm afraid, uh, but they were threatening all of those priceless artifacts in the museum. So I very much did a Mona Lisa type tactic. I put all of these items in, uh, in vaults and then I transferred that file to another world so a completely different world to Martonia, so that that would be safe forever. So that history is still preserved in some form. Unfortunately, the world itself, however, cannot be preserved. Um, this right here is an editing program I use to manage Martonia. Um, and don't let this intimidate you either. If you want to join Martonia, you don't need to know any of this, but this is just what I have to do because I have the files and stuff. Um, I mentioned lag earlier and the chunk errors. Um, if you see in the middle of the screen, 16,265 files were deleted. These are junk entities which were cramming the storage of Martonia so much that these uh, chunk errors kept happening. So we actually had to abandon that world. But as I said, we um, saved the uh, digital history. We ported it to another world. So it's not lost. We called that Operation Exodus, by the way, just a cool name. These are some examples of the chunk errors, which have, uh, all this has happened in the last two weeks. So I actually had to edit the presentation to account for this. This is just a recent natural disaster, I guess. As you can see, it just doesn't look right, does it? You've got a desert and then a random ocean in the middle. You've got an ocean with a swamp going through it. Um, a jungle with Himalayan-esque mountains just tearing through it. It looks ugly and um, as you can see from the railway that was supposedly going through it, it's torn down sections of the railway, which then tears down uh, trade networks be uh, between kingdoms, which means no one can trade, which uh, breaks down, you know, communication. And then you get people fighting over resources. 
yeah, nothing was going well. Uh, you may remember that naval battlefield in the top right from an earlier image. Uh, obviously, those mountains weren't there before. They've just came out of nowhere and they're completely caged in that boat in between two mountain ranges. It doesn't look right, does it? It just looks odd. I apologise for the poor quality of these images. I had to take these on my phone because, as I said, this is a problem that's only just cropped up. Uh, once again, being a limitation of Minecraft. Random square islands. A skyscraper in the bottom left was torn through there. So really, it was just a pain and ruining people's hard work. But is it the is it the end of the project? Probably not. Because very recently, we've started a uh, a second Mortonia. Um, the Operation Exodus I mentioned earlier, porting the Mona Lisa to these vaults meant that we could preserve all of the items from the museum and all of the history logs and just move them to a new world. So we have complete um, knowledge and uh, a timeline dating back to the 1st of April of 2019 still. However, it's on a, a different world. If anyone's confused by that, perfectly understand and I can explain it later. Uh, I hope I've, I've done it justice. But here is a memorial wall inside the new world that's commemorating you know, what was lost. It's very much a case of the Roman Empire collapsing and we're all sad about it. So as I said at the start, remember that image. Uh, I'll just move this zoom thing. Remember the image. Uh, this was taken in April 2019. That's what it looked like then. And this is what it looked like February, early February 2020, uh, 2021. So almost two full years. You've seen how everything's developed. Uh, a whole city has sprung up in this area. So it's cool. That's history. Question time. Excellent. Thank you so much for giving us this walkthrough of Minecraft history. It's, uh, it's an absolutely fascinating project and uh, there's a lot of praise uh, for your presentation and, and uh, the food for thought that you have given us uh, within the chat. So um, very much. Thank you so. very much. Thanks for having uh, me. There was uh, one good question that we uh, missed earlier on. Uh, that was, how much time do you spend in Minecraft? <laughs> oh, it's good that my girlfriend's just left because she wouldn't like to hear my answer. Uh, it varies from week to week. Um, right now, I'm ahead of most of the coursework that I have to do for my final year at uni. So I've got a lot of um, free time. So I spend a bit of it, or rather a lot. Uh, creating these things in this digital space. But the way I see it, um, as evidenced by the interest this has gotten from the Centre for British Archaeology and now this wonderful uh, institution, the Swedish National Heritage Board, uh, I could never have guessed that uh, this little project would have gained that much uh, international attention. So it's almost made all of those hours of what began as a hobby and a little fun project with me and my friends, it's made them uh, you know, worth it beyond just having fun. I'd guess in terms of hours, the average players can spend any well, any time they want. Some people just come on for an hour a day in the evenings with a cup of tea. That's, that tends to be what I do. But if I have nothing on a day or if I've um, done all the edits on my dissertation, which my supervisor wants me to do, then I'll, you know, I'll come on for two, three hours. I think once I spent all day on it, but I got a headache after that. So I wouldn't recommend anyone else do that. Um, some people spend ages on it. Uh, Jacob, who I've mentioned a few times, he's probably the most hardcore, you know, Minecrafter. He knows loads about it. He's on it all the time. He's, he's really intelligent. So, yeah, it's all about, you know, what you want to do, really. Great things. Uh, yeah. There is lots of praise coming in through the chat. Thank you so much. Glad to see that Minecraft archaeology can reach so many users, young as well as older generations. And I think Minecraft is a great tool for communication between generations. Mm -hmm. Everyone can join up around the same buildings and the same stories yeah. and storytelling. 
And I also think that Minecraft has a great potential in cultural heritage interpretation. So, Alex, we have been talking about the workshop at some later stage. Yeah, I'd be happy to. Uh, I'd be happy to further explain things in a workshop. Sure. Because I think there is a great interest in Minecraft, but not everyone knows where and how to start. So perhaps yeah. a bit of advice on getting started. Yeah, I'd be happy to. Perfect. Yeah, I'd I'd love to help people get involved. Be awesome. Uh, this was an interesting question here. Uh, do you have or do you, do you feel an interaction between your studies and playing this? Uh, that's a very good question. I would say yes. Uh, there's been a few notable instances, like with the uh, Saltern that I mentioned earlier. Uh, we were taught about Iron Age Salterns in a uh, historical archaeology module. And, you know, while I did understand the idea of a Saltern, I couldn't really visualise it because there weren't uh, very many illustrations of what one looked like on the inside. So uh, I built one in game using someone's text, uh, someone's paper on the Lincolnshire Fenlands of these Iron Age uh, Salterns. Uh, I used a description of the interior of one based on an archaeological excavation and then a drawing of what one, uh, of, what one of the exteriors uh, may have looked like. And that helped me figure out you know, what a Saltern most likely looked like. So, yeah, I guess in that regard, um, it's helped my studies in some areas. Uh, and like I said at the start, the, the dissertation, which I'm doing on uh, Carolingian annals and Viking invasions, that's influenced how I've looked at this digital project. So the whole idea of writing these annals, that's all come from my dissertation. Interesting. I think that we're running out of time for now. So uh, that was, uh, as of other questions, uh, blown into the presentations as well. Uh, it's been it's been really uh, it's been a very very good time for us watching you and and talking to you here. So, I'm glad everyone uh, enjoyed it. It means a lot. Thank you. No, just a big thank you to Alex for for your presentation. It's really inspiring and interesting to see what can be done. I'd like to say thank you to you, Victor, for giving me this opportunity. I really appreciate it.